Hi, this week we're looking at race and ethnicity. As we look at race and ethnicity, we take a look in the United States and we see that um, we're an ethnically diverse country. Bearing that in mind, the question is how did we become so ethnically diverse? Answer in one word, immigration. Immigration to the United States goes way, 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 way back. Um, and some may argue it goes back from Christopher Columbus, but that's neither here nor there. The bottom line is we're a country of immigrants. Having said that, we have a quota system that determines immigration. Our quota system in and of itself um, appears to favor Europeans over non-white, non-Europeans. With that in mind, in 1965, the Immigration Act abolished the quota system, but even though it did that, inequalities still existed. How did inequalities exist? We gave um, as many Europeans admittance to the United States as Asians, and yet Asia is a larger and more populated, con uh, more populated region than Europe. We give close preference to family members, and because we have more Europeans here, then more Europeans get preference to come to the United States. America uses immigration as a tool in our foreign policy. For example, if we take two countries, Nicaragua and El Salvador, both countries share the same, basically the same geographic region, basically the same culture, basically the same socioeconomic status. And yet, the United States sees El Salvador um, as, as allies, El Salvadoran, the country El Salvador is allies, therefore we accept El Salvadorians as refugees. Nicaragua, on the other hand, the United States sees them as the enemy, therefore unwilling to grant them asylum. So in other words, what that is saying is that if we like you, we allow you to come to our country. And if we don't like you, within our foreign policy, we have stipulations to keep you out. The United States also uses um, immigration as a racially biased tool. How do we do that? An example of this is Cuba versus Haiti. Both in the Caribbean region, both um, experiencing about the same socioeconomic status. As a matter of fact, Cuba is historically communist. And yet, the United States will accept Cubans as refugees, but not Haitians. Um, Cuba, the population, mostly fair-skinned, straight hair. Haitia, Haiti, sorry, the population, mostly dark-skinned, fair, it's mostly dark-skinned, kinky hair. The United States will say to Cuba, come on over. But to the Haitians, we say, no, nope, you cannot come. And there are many other examples of this where the United States uses race um, as a bias in immigration, in its immigration tool. Having said this, again, just to reiterate, race is a biological or physical construct, for example, black, white, oriental, as opposed to ethnicity, which is, which, which is, which is culturally distinctive traits. For example, it's colored by language, religion, custom, or even food. Now, in terms of looking at patterns of intergroup relations, we have a slavery as one of the markers. Right? So when we take a look at slavery, it was slavery was rationalized on the grounds that Africans were uncivilized, therefore they could not handle white privilege. So they were used as an economic source for whites. Moving away from slavery, we had a society that was segregated. 
segregation was based on race or ethnic groups, and the contact between the dominant and the minority group was not allowed. In Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court okayed separate but equal schools. In other words, as a society, we did not have a problem with segregation. Now, two words you'll hear often as we look at race and ethnicity is prejudice and discrimination. They're two different things. How are they different? Prejudice is a thought. I don't like you. Whereas discrimination is an action. Because I don't like you, I won't rent you my apartment. Because I don't like you, I won't give you this job. Um, now, over the years, even though we've had slavery, there's always been resistance to domination. What are some of these forms that resistance to domination come in? We have riots. We have self-segregation, where folks decide, hey, look, I know we're in an era now where blacks and whites can live side by side, but you know what? I am black. I want to live in a black neighborhood. I am white. I want to live in a white neighborhood. And then we have nonviolent protest. Or sometimes some people just look the other way. I remember um, in the 1980s, I, I met an African-American, and she said to me, I've never, never, never experienced racism. And I tried to think to myself, where on this planet does she live? Um, because, if I may, racism isn't only restricted to the United States. So it doesn't matter where she lives on this planet, she's going to experience some sort of racism. At any rate, mm, just saying. Um, in terms of acceptance and integration, um, while folks have not accepted racism, folks have become more tolerant to it. We have the concept of the melting pot. And the concept of the melting pot depends on different factors. For example, who migrated earlier? Who occupies an equal pos position of power? Who has the most similar cultures? And who are the most alike? Now, when you take a look at different ethnic groups, African, African Americans are the only group that has still not blended in to the American culture. What makes it so difficult for the African American to blend into the culture? Um, the skin color and the hair texture. Moving right along, we have assimilation. And in uh, Robert E. Park in 1925 described assimilation in multiple stages. The first stage is the newcomer, and the newcomer is not familiar with the dominant culture, so they struggle for a foothold in terms of jobs, in terms of just finding a place in society. By the second and the third generation, however, the struggle for the foothold has now converted to a struggle for respect, better living conditions. By this time, assimilation has begun to occur. And then we have pluralism. And pluralism, very simply, is where different ethnic or racial groups um, in a society maintain their identity, yet share the same political and economic system. Now, in the United States, we have many minority groups. Well, there are four major minority groups in the United States. Of these four ma major minority groups, I want us to start off by looking at African Americans. Now, African Americans comprise of the largest racial minority group. Their experience vary from poverty to success. They endured the brutalities of slavery. They were granted full citizenship after the Civil War, yet it was not until the, the 1900s or, or, or close to the mid-1900s that we saw any real, um, any real progress in terms of freedom of the African American. The strength of the African American lies within the black churches or within the black church. By the 1960s, federal legisla legislation put an end to most forms of discrimination. True, many African Americans are better off economically and financially than in the past.
but they still struggle disproportionately in terms of unequal of their being unequal to the rest of the population. They live in poverty longer. They live in high poverty areas and high crime areas. While more African Americans are more are more politically um, inclined today, and we have people like um, uh, President Obama, yet for the most part, you don't see African Americans as well represented in politics when compared to other ethnic groups. As of today. 30% of African Americans live in segregation. Today, as a result of segregation, we have poor neighborhoods, poor school districts, poor quality merchandise, and lack of network. In one of the documentaries that you will read for this, that you will view for this week, um, we look at the history of the African American movement or the history of the Civil Rights Movement. And in the Civil Rights Movement, we hear Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. argue that blacks live in the worst neighborhoods. They go to the worst schools, they get the worst jobs. And as of today, while we've seen progress, the progress has been minuscule to what it probably could be. Then we have Hispanic Americans. Hispanic Americans are the second largest uh, minority groups in the United States. So there are three, diff three major groups of Hispanic Americans. They're the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, and the Cubans. The Mexicans first ent enter the country as seasonal workers, for example, picking cotton in Texas in the 1600s. Um, then we have Puerto Rico. In 1917, Puerto Rico was declared um, a commonwealth to the United States. Even though they were declared a commonwealth to the United States, we didn't see mass migration from Puerto Rico until after World War II when um, the airline industry um, started to expand. And with the introduction of the, of the jumbo jet, we had airline fares drop in between Puerto Rico and the mainland. So we see um, heavy commute. Cubans, there were three waves of Cuban migration in the early 1960s, the late 1970s, um, and that was called, free, those were called freedom flights, and then the early, 1990, the early 1980s, which was referred to as the Mario Boat Lift. And basically, um, what the Cuban immigration was about, Cuba said to the United States, or the United States said to Cuba, hey look, we know the Cubans don't want to be there. So we'll take them. We'll take them out of communism. And Cuba says, heck no, you're not getting not even one of our people. Um, and they maintain this until um, Cuba got to the point where, as a communist country, it was defeating itself in terms of its communist purpose, where everyone is equal. And so at this time, you had a lot of people who were homeless, a lot of, um, a lot of criminals on the road because their prisons were overcrowded, a lot of... Um, mentally ill on the road because their mental health facilities were overcrowded and so the Cuban said to the United States hey look you say you wanted our folks so here they are so they put the people that they n no longer wanted they put them on boats and later they put them on flights and later on boats and shipped them to the United States then we have Native Americans so just now I spoke about African Americans and um you, 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 you will hear from time to time how poor African Americans have it in the United States. Nothing close to the Native Americans. So here we have a group of people pushed off their traditional land to reservation. Why? Because the whites needed the land for mining, railroad, gold, oil. The reservations have their own social support, including schools, healthcare system, etc., but they're very poorly funded. As of today, 41% of Native Americans live below the poverty line. 50% live in substandard housing. 70% have to travel one mile or more for water. And they have the shortest life expectancy of all ethnic groups combined. A 
high death rate from accidents, homicides, suicides, alcohol, influenza, pneumonia, and diabetes. Then we have the Asian Americans. So the Asian Americans, when compared to other ethnic groups, they're the most diverse in terms of national origin, socioeconomic status, income, and skills. Um, they're more economically stratified with a highly visible and successful layer of professionalism, and they have a strong middle class. So there are two main groups of Asian Americans. Two, in terms of um, numbers, the two major groups. These are the Chinese and the Japanese. Even though they are both, my, even though they are both Asians, yet they have different experience coming to the United States. For example, the Chinese, when they came to the United States in the mid 18th century, they worked on railroads, laundry, restaurants. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 denied the right to, for Chinese to own land or to become citizens. They were discriminated against in such a way that they decided that they were going to segregate themselves from everybody else. And so they formed enclaves. By the 1965, immigration quotas were abolished. And as immigration quotas were abolished, the Chinese decided, hey, look, you initially told us you didn't want us to be a part of you. And so you know what? We have formed our own communities and we're going to keep it that way. So even though the 1965 immigration quotas um, abolished the, 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 segre the Exclusion Act of 1882, the Chinese still um, decided that they wanted to be separate. Now we have the Japanese, a different experience than the Chinese. They migrated in the 1870s. Once they migrated, they were immediately able to um, establish groceries, flower shops, small businesses. They worked as farmers. They labored in the mills and canneries on the West Coast. Um, they worked in the mines. By, 18, by 1942, we had the East Immigration. We, by 1942, East Immigration halted after Pearl Harbor. Of course, you know what Pearl Harbor was all about. We bombed the Japanese. They bombed us back. Um, and at that point, the United States gathered all affected Japanese on our shores, and um, we put them in um, we, we 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 put them in camps, guarded camps. We took their businesses. We confiscated their property. By 1988, long after the war, the U.S. and the Japanese had um, uh, mended their mended their their um, their relationship. And so in 1988, the United States Senate approved a bill for apology to the Japanese. This bill affected every, in this bill, every affected person that was around during um, the, the, right after World War II that we placed in internment camps, they were offered a reparation of $20,000. The Japanese of all Asian groups are the mostly assimilated. Why? because they have a remarkably large socioeconomic status. Why? They value hard work, devotion, willingness to sacrifice for education, maintaining strong family ties. They were thrifty, work long hours. They have a tendency to be self-employed and they pool their resources together. Having said that, um, that is the end of our lecture on race and ethnicity and I thank you very much.